So we'll begin with this outline. So we're going back to this theme of understanding who your audience is. So we um, used this phrasing in the very first, I, I guess actually in both uh, the previous two sessions. Um, so it's tantamount, right? So understanding, identifying your audience. And with that comes with uh, uh, under, trying to understand the context within which your, in this case, uh, your, your portfolio will be reviewed. Um, what are they looking for? Why are they asking for it? And what, what should you try to communicate in it, right? Um, and then, so that will segue into how you edit, when to, what to include, what to exclude. Uh, so what we want is clear, concise, consistent. And so we'll look at different examples of how to do that. And then different modes of publishing, um, print versus online. Uh, and best practices, meaning, um, so it's, a, it's an evolving document, right? So this informal poll reveals that it's a, it's a living document, it's edited either because it's being submitted for a different reason or because you have new work or you have new insight to your previous work. It's an evolving document. So there are things that you should be doing um, on an ongoing basis, right? Okay. All right. So what are they looking for? So, for, so let's start with um, sharing anecdotes, right? So for those of you who have submitted your portfolios, um, ha, how many of you had, had had a chance to actually, where that led to a face-to-face -to -face interaction, like an interview? So let's, let's share, how do, so first of all, let's share, hear from all three. So how long was the interview, first of all? Yeah. Two hours. Okay. How long was yours for us? Okay, and Nilu? Half an hour, 45 minutes, plus 45 minutes test. It was already Okay, okay. Um, so two hours is, is the exception, right? <laughs> two hours is the exception. It's usually less than an hour. Um, and depending on what they're looking for, what, uh, the position that they're trying to fill, it could be less, even less time. Um, so in that time, so if you kind of think about, um, and, uh, you know, when you have a, when you call a meeting, right, you, you draft an agenda, so you kind of share in advance, you know, a list of topics that you want to cover during the meeting that you want to talk about. So, so who set the agenda? Like, meaning, who determined, who decided what, will, what, was, what the discussions were about? Yeah, not you, right, the other person at the other side of the table. And who set the pace? Meaning, you know, so this is my signature, this is my best work. Right? And I've put in you know, not only an entire year's worth of my life, but also I've updated, revised this, I've done the most polishing in these projects, and especially these two diagrams. Right? So you should really look at those, and not so much in these other things. Right? Did you have an opportunity to do that, set the pace? No, not really. Right? Fraz, you did? Well, because you have two hours. <laughs> no, no, for us it's only an hour, right? Oh, for us. <laughs> I've, yeah. never, I've never had them ask me, which project do you want to talk about? They didn't ask me, I just gave me like an open door and I just went through it, whatever piece I had. Maybe they liked what they saw. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why you got the job. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, <laughs> that is definitely not the norm. Right. Um, so even before you get there, um, so in many cases, you know, so to be able to be granted a sit-down, you know, interaction, face-to-face -face, face -face interaction, you first need to submit it, right? Um, and so, you know, it could be for a variety of reasons. It could be for a summer internship, a full-time permanent position, maybe graduate school, maybe a scholarship, you know, a variety of things. Maybe an installation. Maybe an maybe installation, a, a yeah. Residency. Mm -hmm. A variety of things. Yep. So you want to find out for each one, you know, the what they're looking for is slightly different, right? So let's let's now limit the context to in the setting of an office, let's say. So let's say um, you know it's a it's a summer internship versus um, let's say an entry level but full time permanent position, right? So you know we talked about you know investment. This the you know, hiring and training new employees is an a huge investment on part of the office, and so they want to be careful. So hiring is. is um, from the other side, you know, hiring and you know, staffing, like recruiting, is one of the, the biggest responsibilities of the people, the leaders, people who are in leadership positions in the firm. Like, meaning the, the success of the firm, the success of the project, really relies on, like, it makes the biggest difference, you know, whether or not you're able to attract and recruit people who are talented, you know, who are able to work, work well with others, 
or not, right? And whether those people will stay. And so it takes a, it takes, so they, they want to be careful and they each try to have their own method of screening. Um, it's, you know, depending on the size of the firm, maybe, you know, it's, it's more codified, it's more formalized, and less, so sometimes it's just a gut check, you know, so just people know, like after um, having, um, you know, gone through the process for years and years and having seen enough applications, interviewed enough uh, interviewees, they just know. And other places are more codified, right? It's more spelled out. Um, so the first thing is, so what do you think they are looking for? So, so let's say for an entry level, you know, full-time permanent position where the, their risk is higher. What are they looking for? Skills. Yes. Because you, you have to be able to, you have to generate profit for them, yes. The amount of time put into your work? Yes, because that speaks to the professionalism, how much you care, um, you know, your thoroughness. So in other words, you know, they will look at you know, the portfolio you put in front of them as an example of the kind of work that you might do for them within their office. Right? So let's say you're preparing some, something for a client. You know, the level of care and the amount of time you put in, the thoroughness, so they, they, it's all, they see it as an example of what w you would have done in the office. Right? So skills, amount of time you put in, what else? Range, yeah. Um, I mean, it's great if you have a wider range, but sometimes that's hard to do for uh, like earlier in your career, because you're limited to the kinds of you know uh, academic projects that you know you're given, frankly, and a lot of that is prescribed for you. But which is why it's important that you diversify your activities outside of the academia, right? Through um, volunteerism or you know being involved in AIAS, other right. So range, yes, definitely. What else? Group work. group work. So, like, remember. So, we've talked about your cover letter, which is where you you uh, in your resume, which is where you craft your professional persona, right? You represent yourself, you know, to the profession, right? Um, and so, so it, it it's you're kind of hitting the kind of the basic marks for minimum competencies, right? So, we talked about amount of time and care you put into it, right? Uh, are there so no errors, right? No, no room for error in those documents, but specific to the portfolio, right? So you, so let's say like there's some kind of a filter test that they use, right? So you met, you pass the resume test, you pass the cover letter test, so now it's a portfolio. What are they looking for in the portfolio? Why do we make a portfolio? In our profession, why do we make a portfolio? You is, is in the, at the end of the day, is what we do as architects two-dimensional? No, right? But we have to represent it in many different ways, including on a print mat or you know, flat, something on a two-dimensional, whether it's a screen or a paper. So you know, the first and foremost, it's your visual communication skills, right? So they've seen your written, sample of your written, right? Ability to kind of summarize and prioritize your relevant experiences in your resume and your cover letter, right? So the portfolio is the first time where, like, it's, it's, right, it's visual. I mean, in a way, it, it's the most representative of you, I think, for most of you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would take it to be like mm -hmm. this. In, in other vocations, you have your transcript, right. which talks about your, how you, pl it really, what the grade is saying is how do you place relative to your peers? We have a, a, we have a product that does the exact same thing, which is why I would argue that I know you, it's never happened for you, it's never happened for me. I've never really met anyone in a profession who's worked at any kind of a legitimate firm where they asked him what the GPA was. Mm -hmm. we, we don't care because this tells us much more about what kind of work you do and how you value your work and how you value your thinking and your ability to communicate than a grade in a class for whatever happened. Right, and this is true even for most graduate schools. Like I think certain scholarships, you know, they set some minimum thresholds. But for you know, graduate architectural graduate schools don't you know um, don't prioritize GPA or your GRE scores over your portfolio, right? Because at the end of the day, this is much closer to how we're actually going to work, right? How we're going to visually represent our ideas, other people's ideas, how we consolidate, how we synthesize, convince others, right? Um, so with that. So it runs the gamut. So how, how will it be reviewed, right? So they, they form impressions. So like it's all about this process. We talked about how unfair this is. Um, 
because <laughs> you have they have so much to they have a lot more at risk so they have a lot more to lose so they're much less willing to take a chance right so it's unfair for you um, but this whole process is um, stacked against you in a way like especially in the beginning right did, did you guys just see what she did <laughs> yeah who looked who saw Karen who was actually watching her when she or what did you just see her do she yeah. That's it. That's yeah. right there. That's that's how long someone really spends in your portfolio. The, because the in that pass, snap judgment, right? she decided, is it worth for me to actually open it all the way? And I've seen this happen. Mm -hmm. Where literally they go like, okay, so tell me, why do you want to work at this firm? No, it's true. This actually did happen to me. So in one of the interviews, so the interviewer uh, first, you know, excused himself. He said, you know, I apologize. You might think this is rude, but this is how I interview everybody. And he, he literally picked up the book and he went like this, and he closed the book, and then and then the, the interview began, in, in, uh, improper. Yeah. And he flipped yeah. it backwards. Start from the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just in case you, uh, well, some people maybe he was Israeli and he does right to left, but it could be right. just because they want to see is the last thing right. any good. And another thing you can do with this is, does anything pop at you? Mm -hmm. There's there's many different tests for this. So it's all about you are being judged. You're under scrutiny, right? Starts with your cover letter, your resume, extends into your portfolio. Your references. With the, your references, right? Starting with the cover, the font, the kind of paper, if it's on screen, you know, the size of text, every, everything you're being judged, right? And so, so what do you think they can, what information are they, the, is the interviewer actually taking in when they do this? So let's say it's printed matter, right? So it's, it's bound in some way like this, right? So what do you think, so and it's gonna have, you know, like it's fairly um, consistent in the kinds of, uh, so it's all visual work, three-dimensional work, models, drawings, right? There's, you know, uh, some process work, some final proposals, right, of different kinds of projects. So the content is going to be very similar, um, but when they do this, what are they looking for? What's, what impressions are they forming? Before they even like, okay, what was the you know? Before they even delve into the project, what impressions are they forming? No, she's doing it backwards. Yeah. Right. So how much how much they can actually take in, right? So in other words, um, how organized it is, like for me personally, right? So if they if it's so you talked about how much time you put in. So um, part of what where that time should go to is you're thinking. So there's. You can think of it as raw data, so all of the work that you've done, you know, which was for a very different purpose, uh, very different audience in studio. So now you have this, all of this raw data. So how do you, sorry, okay. how, do you, how do you make it fit into this? You know, or like, you know, the size is, I don't mean the size, but into a two-dimensional bound printed matter, right? How do you, where do you start? What do you include? What do you not include, right? And how do you communicate to the interviewer that you're somebody who um, one can see the forest for the trees, meaning you understand what are the skills, the strengths. I want to I want to kind of differentiate the words between skills and strengths. Uh, what your strengths are and how best to show it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know when I when I do this I, the flipbook effect, what I'm looking for more than anything else is pacing. Mm -hmm. Uh, organization. Mm -hmm. So, are things lining up when you do this? And, and one of the and you know numbers don't line up; they jump out at you very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, I know are they laying this out in Illustrator? In, in design, are they using the right tools, right. or are they doing things the hard way? Um, if everything feels like if I flip through this and nothing sticks out, then it's basically they're just using a template and they're not really thinking about uh, pacing in the sense of right. You're gonna have when you're when you're filming, you're gonna have zoom ins. You're gonna have the wide shot, the establishing mm -hmm. shot. Variety, yeah. Yeah, you're, mm -hmm. you're gonna do it in such a way it breaks it up that it's still part of the story, but there's different elements of of the story that you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. if everything looks the same. To me, th at that point, I read it less like a portfolio, more like a catalog, mm -hmm. and I get bored. Mm -hmm. All I think all designers, especially if you gotta look through, I mean, you know, this is like what 20 of these. Mm -hmm. You guys have heard the story of, of Kelton a couple years ago when he was interviewing and he had 150 to go through in like three hours. For one position, right? Yeah, yeah. for one position. Mm -hmm. He's like, I, mm -hmm. I can't spend more than You have to narrow minutes. it down somehow. I think he spent like right. 30 seconds per mm -hmm. for the first batch. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate, something like that? Mm -hmm. That was something I said. Yeah. yeah. Let's go to the next. All right. 
So your portfolio should so cover the basics. So no spelling errors, formatting. So if you use a title page, make sure that you're you're, you're set up your template so that it's consistent. Um, so it has a you know holistic, consistent feel and look to it. And highlight your competencies, right? So if you are really professional in, as a renderer, as um, research, or right, so so highlight those, feature those. But I think in a way the the uh, more important than any of those is your values, right? So connect it back to what you said about yourself in the cover letter and how you customized your resume, right? If in your co cover letter, right, so which is where you listed, you know, what you learned about the firm and how your interests align with the, the firm's research interests, and if you were fortunate enough to be able to reference a project that you've done that would be in your portfolio, make those connections really, really obvious, right? This is where you're aligning your values with their values. Right? And so the skills are important, all of the, the formatting, those are all input, but those are basics. Right? Everybody should do that. Right? But where you can rise above the rest is you know, try to uh, communicate your values through the work and the way you present it. And right? another way to think of that phrase, mm -hmm. emphasize your values, mm -hmm. is you want to emphasize um, what you believe in and why, why you want to work with them. But just as importantly, it's not just that you line up your values with their values, but on a pragmatic level that you are of a value to them. Because if you're applying for an entry level position, they're not really gonna be all that interested in um, your conceptual stuff if that's all you have. Your day to day job is gonna be much more of the mundane and the pragmatic, the detailing, the kind of schematic stuff. It's not gonna be you master planning a city. So, and, and you wanna know you know, if, if you're applying to a residential firm, maybe you want to throw in a project, either you did it yourself or you did it in school, that relies to the firm or relays to the firm that you actually understand that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, this happened to me. I was I, I thought I was applying at Foster for the special group, geometries group, and at the last second they switched to interviews and it was one of the principals of the firm, and he was not at all interested in that. And he, and he starts asking me these questions, and my portfolio is geared towards that. You know, it's, it wasn't really my fault. I found out like an hour and a half before the interview that I wasn't meeting with the person I thought I was meeting in, in London. So it's not like I was going to make a new one. But all my stuff was geared towards computation and he starts asking me about what my experience is in mixed use and in high rises and I'm like, mm. mm. no, I can tell him, I can lie, I can say the truth, whatever mm -hmm. it is, but my portfolio didn't show it. Mm -hmm. That will happen. Yeah, so I mean, barring unforeseeable you know, services like that, you, you want to tailor right, yeah. each application. Um, let's, yeah, go to the next. So what to include, what to exclude? So I, I think most of you who have submitted, um, or how many of you have come across a limit, like in terms of uh, the number of pages or file size, right? So nobody wants two gigabyte files, which we're only entertaining you here <laughs> because For a you're PDF students. of one page. I know, right? So there's always, always, almost always uh, a limit, right? So 10 pages, 12 pages, six megs, 12 megs, right? Three pages. Three pages, yeah. It's a common one. Right? Um, and then I think for work sample sheets. And how many of you know, or have you been requested to submit a work sample sheet with your cover letter and resume, right? So even before they want to see the entire portfolio, they want samples, right? Um, okay, so you've, you've had 10 studios, semesters of studios, right? Um, each studio, and let's say you, you know, every single one of those projects is spectacular. They're all going into the portfolio. That's the first cut, right? So deciding which projects, which studio projects go in the portfolio and which don't, um, which goes to the front, right, which go, which is, so let, you know, so we're going to still say that the front end of the portfolio is the, the high real estate, the high, you know, what is that, the, the desirable real estate, so your best work should be in the front, right, the one, so again, the ones that exhibit your values, right, that uh, align with the firm's values should be in the front, um, so let's say you, let's say all 10 projects meet the, meet your cut, right, so then, you know, how do you, and within each project you've done, you know, for each one, 15 uh, weeks worth of work, you know, and if you have to, if you only have for the entire, um, you know, curriculum, you only have 12 pages, how do you cram, right? I mean, you can fill 12 pages with half of a semester, right? What do you do? How do you decide? How do you decide what stays and what doesn't stay within each project? Mm -hmm. depends it depends on the firm. It depends on what you want to highlight. But what else? So in other words, 
the so you know you've seen already um, so they're looking at they're not they don't really care you know how many projects are in there or where pro one project begins and where what comes next they're looking at it as a as a body of work of your work right in its entirety this is what you're showing them this represents me right this represents my values and my strengths um, and so then how do we remove redundancies so for each studio we all kind of we, the the pattern is very similar so we at the end of the semester we all have a building of some kind so the beginning of the semester and along the way we have some kind of a site study some kind of you know program study some kind of uh, concept development right so these are all required of you right the, so how do we so we don't have room first of all right we don't have room to put include every single thing that you've done even if it was really really good so how do we how do we do that how do we Most filter dying. So each Sorry. project actually tells a story. Uh -huh. So within the story of what you're actually trying to relate, uh, probably uh, focusing on the concept and then uh, you show body of work to actually relate to the story that you're actually telling and summarize it and make it succinct as possible. Yeah, so I think the key word there is story, right? So in other words, so within its project there's a story, but there's a, do we, would you say that there's a story within the whole body of work as well? Yes. And I would say that's yeah. actually more important than within the project. Right. You know, when you think of story, and I'll, I'll use movies today, one, because it's on my head, but two, because it's, it's a lot easier for you guys to relate to that. You don't have to go through the montage for every scene in the movie. Like every fight, think about the first one, if it's like a boxing movie or something, right? There, you see the training and the getting better, and then the next one, it starts being just the fights. You don't have to go through the whole step. Mm -hmm. I almost did it too. <laughs> um, so really think about, I think what Karen's getting mm -hmm. to is not just the pro what's your concept, what's the process, and what's the final, but how do you show those elements throughout without, so that each project gets its due diligence, but, but each project doesn't become repetitive or redundant. Right. We don't need to see the initial concept sketch for every drawing, plus all the development for every project, plus, plus, plus. Mm -hmm. Instead, when we see it on mm -hmm. the first one, I just assume, yeah, all right, you got it. If there's nothing in terms of development in, in subsequent projects, mm -hmm. then I start to get a little nervous. Because then I think, okay, maybe they just developed a skill set and they're mm -hmm. not showing it. Right. So show something, maybe it's one process drawing along the way or, or a concept yeah. model and, is just and, as important. Yeah. And that depends on how you tailor it. But you know, first you wanna kind of you know, figure out what, what your story is. And this, again, ties to um, your cover letter, right? Um, so let's say, let's say that you know, based on your, so you're somebody who deeply cares about you know, making things, right? So this is what really drives you. Like this is why you love architecture and that's the kind of position that you want to apply to. You love making, you know, working in the wood shop, making with materials, and so then you, and you hope to do this more while being paid, right? And so then you would want to present that as something, as a strength, as a passion, and also as something that you would want to do and that you're good at. Um, and then, so if we had that kind of a filter or lens, then do you think, in, in now retrospectively, you know, scanning your, all of your previous projects, um, and your earlier semesters, the first you know, couple of years where you're still kind of trying to figure out you know, who you are as a designer, as an architect, is going to be a little bit less um, obvious. But for the last three years, two, three years, would you say that you should be able to discern that pattern? If you're somebody who's, who loves to work with wood, you know, like, can you think of an example of somebody who found a way to make a woodworking tool, use a woodworking tool for a model or something for that project every semester? No? <laughs> then We'll look at an example in the, in, in, in the later part. Yeah, yeah, we'll look at, but anyway, so, so find that lens, right? So, you know, so uh, there, there could be an instance of where it was a, a series of concept models, you know, where you, you explore the properties of wood. Or it could be a furniture making class, or you know, you know, where, where you are now working with wood at a different scale for different purpose, right? Or there could be something where um, you uh, maybe a final model, like there was a, a, a not the scale little ones, but there was a f or a much bigger size, a wall section detail, something like that, where you just really were, felt so impassioned about learning about the the material um, and how they assemble, right? So then these kind of become now, you know, they rise to the top, right? They become priorities. They become part of your story, right? The, the kind of the, the big picture of your story. 
And so then, you know, the other kinds of drawings of work or other studios, you can consolidate them, right, into different categories. You don't have to continue the, um, the categories of the, the course names, right? So we also mentioned that the class names 110, 150, 210, these are irrelevant to people outside of this context, right? So you, you're not married to them. So you can freely, um, you know, group things together. You know, you can group all of your precedents. You can group all of your, you know, like drafting skills, right? You can group all of your conceptual diagrams, right? And then, th and then leave space for the ones, th the skills, and the, your passions that you want to feature. As an example, yes. Let's go to the next one. Um, so here's an example of. So there's three examples of, you know, how different ways that the positions are advertised. So. Do you guys know Thomas Pfeiffer, yeah. architect? Yes, like beautiful work. Um, so for him, so we have submissions in PDF format no larger than 10 megabytes. So you know, they didn't really say how many pages. They didn't really care. They just wanted to make sure that the file size wasn't too big. That's easy, They're, you know, easier than others. Let's look at the next one. So also notice, right, so it's a resume and work samples, right? They didn't ask for portfolio. They didn't ask for only for resume, but resume and work samples. That's probably the most common. Yeah. Oh, and real, real important, are you sending it to the principal there? You're sending it to a, uh, a mailbox. So um, anything that is, falls outside of the requirements will get dumped into spam or deleted without even being opened. If the file is 12 megabytes, unless some miracle happens or you don't send the right information, they'll just get rid of it. It's not going to anyone who knows anything about it. It's purely the first person. Resume of Thomas Pfeiffer is probably just someone in admin who's just checking mm -hmm. to see that you have the requisite stuff. And if you mm -hmm. don't, she's not going to check back or he's not going to check back with you. Mm -hmm. They will just delete. OK, so this one is a, for a senior architect, right? Um, so the, the, what they're asking for is a little bit more in depth. Um, you know, so they ask for, let's see. Eight so plus years of solid work experience. Yeah, so those are the qualifications. But what I found interesting is the last paragraph here. Um, so this particular, Stephen Hall, they don't want links to websites, FTP postings, or any format not described above. They want hard copies, right? This is just what they ask for. These are their requirements. And this is their first test. It's, a lot of firms do this. They'll ask for specific things, and they'll embed it inside of their their, um, their posting, just to see if you're paying attention. Are you cold, cold emailing, so to speak? Yeah. Are you just sending out the same crap to everyone? Or are you reading through these things carefully? Mm -hmm. So one thing to consider, right, and this is, again, this is near and dear to our hearts, mm -hmm. when we give you guys assignments and you guys don't fulfill them in the right way, that's, that's essentially telling us that as recommenders mm -hmm. or as, right. as peers of the people you're gonna be applying with, that mm, you know, this is this is making sure that you're you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's, mm -hmm. right. and th these are the same skills we're teaching, you, trying right. to. And the last one, so this one's um, for SOM. This is for summer internship, so it's it's just a uh, you know um, it's a multi-page thing, right? It's a long scrolling web page, and this is just where the um, the requirements are spelled out. So this one, right, so the underlying bold applicants who do not submit work samples will not be reviewed. So meaning it's a summer internship, so it's a short term, right? So the, so the summer internship is a recruiting tool within the, uh, the office of SOM, meaning so it's a very, uh, it's lower, it lowers their risk uh, for them to be able to then scan and kind of identify like who it is that they actually do want to hire full time, right? So it's a, it's a really robust program. Um, so they, there's actually a curriculum, you know, there's different seminars and field trips and other things. And so, and people, uh, depending on which office, you know, a lot of applicants, not just, you know, regionally within the driving distance, but, you know, from abroad and out of town, a lot of people apply. Yeah. And so, so for such a short, it's a three month summer thing. So for such a, such a short duration where they get large volumes of applications, you know, if they if they have to you know, reach, you know, take a second another step and ask for the work samples, they're not going to bother, right? So they're just saying up front, right? If you don't show us a work sample, and the work sample, like uh, so, as we said in the beginning, it is in a way is kind of your heart and soul of who you are as a designer, right? It's it, it's um, their way to get a better understanding of <coughs> the kind of designer that you are, much more so than your cover letter or the resume, right? And also, notice the 10 to 20 pages, PDF, right, yeah. and then the date. 
Mm -hmm. right, so I, I, I'm always... So this is the San Francisco office, by the way, so if you want to apply, it's March 20th. You have one month. Yeah. And should you apply on the 20th? When's the best time to apply? 25. What's up? 26, 27. How about tomorrow? Right, don't wait. I have made this mistake plenty of times for some reason. Um, we see a deadline and we assume that's when we're supposed to. We have like a 10 minute window that we're supposed to apply to. And you get into like, oh, well, is it Pacific Standard Time or is it Eastern Standard Time? Well, hold on, it's a China office, so I think I could. It's like, don't, don't wait until the last second to apply for these things because if, they're get, if they fill up, they say March 20th, but if they fill up on, on February 27th, then the, it doesn't matter if you turn it in March 20th, they're already gonna have their list. And you're gonna be all the way at the bottom. So even if, if, you, if they do look at it, they're already gonna be preset against it. Because look, it's 10 days to go through what, three or 400 mm -hmm. per, per mm -hmm. the, you have San Francisco, so New York, LA. Of, actually, they're doing a lot of this, this okay, first. which one and looks, then, yeah. And then they're doing a lot of this, right? Yeah. Okay, and then, okay, so what not to do? So. <laughs> it feels like this in my area. <laughs> <laughs> so do not clutter, right? So it's really hard. I know, I've, I face this issue myself. It's really, really hard. But the portfolio is not where you dump everything you've ever done, right? So again, you go back to your storyline. You go back to how you highlight your passions and your values. So don't clutter. So in other words, if you clutter, so if you try to put in too much, well, they said, I can only, I have to fit, I have you know, 20 pages worth of work that I wanna show that I've already screened that I have to try to fit it on 10 pages. Right? I know what I can do. I can shrink everything to 20. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I can shrink everything. Or there's some a little bit of white space here. I'm going to fill that up. Right? Don't do that because why? What happens if you clutter? What do you lose? Emphasis? Yeah. Focus? Yes. Clarity. Right. So when they're doing this, right, and they don't get that, right, they don't get the sense that this had, was laid out with an emphasis and a focus and a story, right? It's, it's packed, right? It's really dense. They're not, right, so it doesn't, it's not successful. Yeah. Don't list, right, so list doesn't imply that you've thought about what your story is. There's no filter that you're looking retrospectively uh, to your projects. Don't cram, don't dump, right? Oh my you, God, the last one. Yeah. Do not reduce your final view boards. I know, look, you guys spend a lot of time doing these boards yeah. and we appreciate it and we love you for it and we get this enough at Spring Show so we can tell you without a doubt, do not reduce your boards. Um, I can't tell you how often we see this. It's, it's, it's a design problem. And just like you don't want to take your stuff that you do on your desk and just pin it up, in an ideal world you should be able to, but we know that's not the reality. We want to see the same care. And notice that we're just saying the same stuff over and over again. Right? We need mm -hmm. to edit ourselves again. <laughs> it's a design question. If you're just reducing your boards, you're not, you're not resolving it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have 24 by 36 inch boards. I'm just gonna shrink them. What's my size? It's this, it does, it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna, yeah. And my, my favorite thing, bless you, is, is when you see the, uh, the drawing that's this big and it's 160,000 square feet and they're like eight scale. Like, <laughs> right. Or you have your name on it and you have like all the information and then it doesn't quite match up with the stuff on the side. Mm. It's like, it's, it's just don't do it. It's a story you're telling, for, and it's a different medium. So there's no way that you should. How far away should you be from a board when you're looking at it, realistically? Six feet. Six feet or more. Let's say yeah, like four to ten feet away. When when you're, and that's where it's catching attention. When's the last time you read a book from six feet away? It just has. It's a totally different medium, mm -hmm. even though they're both printed. So appreciate that and and use it to your advantage. It shouldn't be a, mm -hmm. a headache. It should be an exciting yeah. opportunity to design. Should we talk about curate or do it? Oh, God, let's, yeah. Let's do it while we look at the examples. Okay. So we'll come back to the word, what it means to curate something, right? We'll, but we'll do it while we review sample portfolios. Pauses, I love white spaces. So white spaces is, is, um, says that you are in control, right? It's, it's a luxury, right? It, it, it's, it says that you're not, you don't have, you are not insecure. <laughs> I love wet space, right? Wet space it says all awesome. of those things to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you guys ever take a uh, graphic design portfolio design class from Mary Scott? This is probably her main point in 
you said, the use of white space is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And uh, from a graphic design point of view, um, it's, your, it's your palette. So I just want to emphasize that. And she has come here once, uh, and we saw a fairly strong example. Hopefully she'll come again. And the other side of the coin is white space is very difficult to pull off well. Mm -hmm. There's the other extreme of this is called a floater. Who knows what mm -hmm. that means? Yes. Any guesses? We'll we'll show you I, that yeah. one. I think is a good example yeah. of this. So consider white space should be used effectively. It shouldn't just be a sea of white with a thing in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I love these kinds of paintings um, because there's there's um, it's visually interesting because there's depth. And I, I firmly believe that even in these printed matters, so even though it's not a you know, landscape painting or even a single subject matter, because you are trying to organize and fit in, in a harmonious way, um, different kinds of information, you know, maybe there's a photograph of a model, a diagram of something, or a site plan, maybe some text, um, that there is flow, right? So your eye is, you know, usually starts a, a, at, at a point and then it moves around. Right? And especially for you know, graphic work like this, we don't read it the same way like we would read text, you know, going from Oops, <laughs> left to top left to the bottom right corner. Um, so try to think about, try to kind of squint at it and, and think of it compositionally. Right? And so you can take a lot of cues from these kinds of paintings where you know, there is white space and that has a role. And there's areas where there's a, you know, a lot more saturation of the ink. Right? Um, and those serve as focal points in a different way than the white space. And then there's depth um, and you know, uh, these diagonals, um, I forget, you know, these compositional devices that are used, right? And they, they all kind of guide the, the viewer's eye you know, around the painting in a very intended way, with, where there is a sense of uh, organization, hierarchy, not clutter, right? Not disorganized and not uh, competing against each other. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, like literally white space. It can just be a balance, a compositional. So these are deep corn paintings, um, right? There's so think, think of. Hmm? There's a horrific yellow tinge to it. Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, you know, so think of your your layout, your spread of your book as a canvas, right? And try to assign, um, you know, compositional roles to, you know, each part of the page, right? And try to curate, you know, the information that you've selected so that they work together. We can flip through these. <laughs> Not bad, right? What do you guys think? Yeah. Careful. Yeah. So clear, concise, and consistent, right? Um, so we talked about, so you don't, get, you don't set the pace, and you don't get to decide, well, let's talk about this project first, then this project. You don't get to do that. So your clear visual communication is your best defense. It's your best opportunity, where you have some control over how it'll be viewed, right, and what will be looked at the most. Um, so kind of fundamentals of, you know, be, because it's, mul it's a multi-page document, whether it's printed or online, um, use a template, right? Identify uh, which software would be the best for the kind of look that you're trying to create, and how many. De uh, also, depending on how many pages, right? Um, yes, template and modules. And by template, I, I like to think of it in terms of this. When, when you guys start a design problem, what's usually the first thing that we do in, in a studio? <coughs> Bless you. What's up? Before even that, you'll do an exercise that we ask you to do, to look at some other examples. What are those called? Precedents. Precedents, case studies, to kind of frame what, how it's been done already and to kind of frame yourself. So I like to do the same thing when I do books or portfolios, stuff like that. But the source that I never, ever, ever go to are architecture portfolios. How many graphic design classes have you guys taken? No. No, well, one between the whole group, right? One-ish. <laughs> Okay, so why, why look at people who've never mastered this? Would you, if, if, you know, you can go to Costco and buy a, a book, or buy a book, buy a software like House Designer, you can make a house. Doesn't mean it's a good one, and why would you study for five years in an undergrad program if you can just buy a software? Same thing with graphic design. Yeah, we, we talk about it and we touch on it, but the reality is there's whole fields dedicated to this. Look at those examples. Find books that you find compelling layouts that you're inspired by, and use those as your case study. It doesn't matter if it's a book about, I was gonna bring in a book from the French Laundry today, 
-hmm. because it's one of the, the best graphic design books, I've, uh, one of the best layouts I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. It's totally out of left field. Things are not quite lining up in the way that you think they should, but yet you're left with just this, this amazing document of art that happens to be culinary, not, not painted. Mm -hmm. um, so graphic design, book design, art. Um, I've seen some, some great books laid out that are just like fiction, graphic novels. I mean, it doesn't really matter what, but look at people who do this for a living and use them as your inspiration, as opposed to other architects that you like, like finding the portfolio of Bjark Engels from when he was in school. It's like, yeah, but you're not him, mm -hmm. so you should have your own voice. Mm -hmm. Oh, and should we talk about the last point? Oh, yeah. So, so inevitably, there is text that shows up in the portfolio, because thank goodness you were asked to write you know, a little something for every project, right? Um, so when you have, so we already explained the bar, the expectation, whether it's fair or unfair, the bar that is set for um, you know, any kinds of you know, errors, grammatical or spelling-wise, in your cover letter and resume. So the same applies to the portfolio, right? So if you know that your written English is shaky, Right and portfolio, um, and you know that there's and you should include text. You know, so don't use it as an excuse not to include text. But the text that goes into the portfolio, you should you have to give it the same level of care, the same level of you know external editors and proofreaders in addition to your own, because um, it's nothing more embarrassing than right. So again, you know, they're looking at this as an example of you what you might do for their client, right? And so it's one thing to have you know possess this gra you know beautiful you know graphic hand. Uh, but go that extra mile and make sure that text that is you know, playing a really important compositional role in that page spread is also you know, says something meaningful and is free of errors. Um, so we'll look at some examples of layouts, you know, how you kind of, um, like, so I kind of, real, real estate is something that comes to mind. So you, you want to differentiate different zones. So we talked about templates and modules, right? So there are different kinds of information, and by now, in our fourth and fifth years, they're fairly predictable, right? So we have some small images, some big images, some process drawings, some final you know, proposal renderings, and so f f uh, model photographs, and so forth. And so they, uh, um, depending <coughs> on what they are and what role that they played in the project, and more importantly, what story you're telling over the entire arc of your portfolio, you know, th they, they should have a hierarchical relationship to each other, right? Um, and so size is definitely something that establishes hierarchy, right? Where it lands on the page, right? Um, and in a way, what that trumps all of that is the white space, right? So something that has, is, a, is um, given the luxury of more white space around it is the one that is going to have a much bigger presence, right? Um, so in this one, you know, we have the big images in the, in the, in the top, um, and then uh, a sequential progress diagram in the middle, and then miscellaneous text and other kind of an analytical drawing or analysis of the structure and so forth in the bottom, right? So it's a, there's a very clear division of zones, right? And the kinds of information that belong in each of those zones. Right? So this could be a very simple template that you follow for all your new projects. Um, so another one is, you know, so use of white space, but also the black background. Um, so we will talk a little bit about, you know, the difference between using white space intentionally and letting things float. Um, so when it comes to, you know, black background, when you use black background, um, you know, use it very intentionally. So this is an example of where the black background on the bottom of this sheet um, actually, it works really well graphically for the composition of the overall set of boards, right? So in other words, it doesn't seem superfluous. It doesn't seem willful, you know? So in other words, if that white background had to go away, the board would look very different. It would read very different. So, you know, it's not that it's a taboo, but use it effectively. Use, use it to an end. Um. Do you, do you want to talk about process a lot? Do you, you don't need a break, do you? you know, like we're no. taping. All right. Keep going. <laughs> um, so we've touched on this a little bit. The storyboard is super duper important. Uh, the mistake that many of us make is we just kind of start putting things together and then hope that inspiration strikes and that the project will look awesome when we're done. But the reality is, and uh, what we're trying to get across here, is that this is a carefully curated and told story and you wouldn't just start writing and hope that you develop a beautiful piece of fiction. You would have an idea of what you want, 
you would set up characters, and so forth. Uh, you should have the same thing when you lay out your, your book. Long before you start going into InDesign, what I do is I, I, I get out a sheet, I get out a trace, and I start thinking about what, what is the story I want to mm -hmm. tell? What, what am I going to do? How is this story going to be told? And I know it's, like, it's almost ridiculous how often we're saying story, story, story when you're like, it's individual projects. But we're aware that we're, we're trying to sell someone not on what we did, but on who we are. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be compelling in a way that, right. that gets them engaged. Right. So think of this, this kind of the storyboarding, telling, you know, being able to um, cons you know, identify what your story is as your best opportunity to communicate to the person you know, what your approach is. Right? So by you know, fourth and fifth year, you know, you're starting to now have affinities, preferences, things you know you like, things you know you don't like. Right? So your identity is, is forming. Right? Your approaches are being individualized. Right? So in the way you tell the story, in the way, the sequence in which you present the material, in right, the hierarchy you assign to certain pieces, right, these are all um, the best ways to communicate to them what your approach is, where, you know, where, what inspires you, where do you start? And how do, you, how do you construct that process that lead to the final? So you can see this is both the process of making the portfolio, but also the process of making the product. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's a little weird because I don't really see a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I fall into the camp of the portfolio is the ultimate design problem that, that any interviewer gives you or any firm. Right. So it should be treated in the same way that your design problem. So this, this thing of what is your process gets really, really muddy because mm -hmm. it's, it's I, I constantly ask the question of like, is my project not really in line with what I'm trying to say in this portfolio? Which one goes away? And surprisingly, the, the project is less important than the portfolio itself for me. Yeah. If it means I have to do new graphics, if it means mm -hmm. I have to do different graphics, mm -hmm. if it means the project just doesn't fit, mm -hmm. um, so be it. Yeah. And in, in almost all cases, I can't think of a case where you, this wouldn't apply, you, you would have to re-sequence um, how you actually did it. So let's say in, in a studio environment, you're all given the handouts, you know, you're, you're, everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. But if you retrospectively look at it in hindsight, different pieces were more or less important to you at certain points, right? And so, so that's, um, that's the part of how you identify your arc, your story, right? That's how you start to differentiate yourself from somebody else who has a different approach or different things were important to them. And one of the things I'm most interested in when, when I look at portfolio, and I've, I've talked to a number of people, and it's, this is definitely on, on when you get starting towards the computational side, but I, I think this applies to all design, is um, the relationship between the response and the argument. Oftentimes we talk about, mm -hmm. when we think about like what our studios are about, we say like we had to design a building. Rarely is that the case. Mm -hmm. 250 is not a, a building that you're designing, but it's, it's talking about program. 310 is talking about sequencing. 350 is about the environmental response mm -hmm. and your, your relationship to nature. 410 is not a high-rise studio. That's the vehicle that we test those things mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. but it's about a holistic approach to systems. Mm -hmm. You know, 450 is comprehensive. That's where everything comes together. Mm -hmm. So it's less important and it's, it's almost, you know, it's counterproductive to say, we were tasked with doing this. Here is my response. It's much more kind of intriguing when you go like, I was interested in this notion of, of nature and how it can be appropriated by blah, 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 blah. So, and then, and then you're, saying, you're rephrasing this as, she told me to make it this way, therefore here's my response. And instead is, I asked myself a question based on mm -hmm. the, uh, the theme that the studio addressed. And I tested out that, that question via my architectural response. I think that's a, a really powerful tool. I think all of you, like to be, I mean, all of you should use, think about using that tool. So meaning, you know, it's a, it's a tall order to say, you know, and do, right? It's a tall order to say, okay, let's, you know, reorganize my, you know, my, one of my studios that I did two years ago, right? So at the time, you know, we did this first, then we were asked to do this, then we were asked to do this. So it's a very passive process. You're a passive participant. But in, a, in hindsight, so now with this, um, you know, th this question, the query that you are able to elicit after the fact, that can be used as a tool to you know, dram dramatically reorganize right, how you would actually present it. Right? So in other words, what that, so to, the, to the audience, what that's, so the comparison of the two, so what the one says right, is a lot of passivity. Right? So okay, they were told to do this, they were told to do this, they were told to do this, and led to this. And the other one, where there's a question posed, 
right? Or there's a starting point, a you know, point of interest, you know, stated, and that's how the project is opened. Um, then the, what it communicates is, you know, this person um, is taking ownership, right? This person has reflected on what the studio meant. And even though this person is, you know, going through the same list of assignments as everybody else, um, there's much more involvement, much more active engagement, right? You know, it's, 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 it's um, co-authoring that, that studio, that class, right? So it's a lot more work, the second one, because you have to identify what that question is. But it's, it, it, I think it kind of uh, separates, you know, the, the portfolios that are worthwhile to the ones that are not. Then it becomes a series of theses as right. opposed to yeah. a series of projects that you did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It could be, it could start out as, as something as messy as this, right? You're simply deciding on the size of your pages, how, the, how will the spreads work, you know, how will you organize, what are the rough sizes, you know, the smallest drawing can be on that paper size, the bigger something should be. How do you assign the visual interests? Um, and they could, the text, the banners, um, could also be simple but powerful ways to describe your approach. Um, so, you know, it could be a, a template where you dis you, um, one pa side of the spread identifies the context and then the other side is, uh, is labeled a device, but it's really, it's the approach, it's the starting point, it's the mechanism um, um, through which the design evolved, right? And then the proposal at the end. So it's a very simple and straightforward process, but, um, you know, just in the word, in the use of the word device, it already um, connotes, you know, a much more active, right, where you're looking for um, a, a method or a tool, right, to, to lead you into a design concept, right? So it's not a, a passive receptacle of all of the things, uh, the influences, but it's something that actively engages. And then just other ways to graphically differentiate, you know, different kinds of information. So this is in a case where, um, so there are big drawings, little diagram drawings. Um, there are disparate kinds of information that put different points in time uh, through, through the semester. But just the use of, you know, again, the, the black background, right? So we know that those are zones identified to describe the, the concept, right? The, the process of how you got to the final. And so um, the proximity doesn't feel uncomfortable, right? So the, the process in the black, against the black background is right next to the proposal, the final drawings. Um, and it, it's okay because we understand that they're zoned differently, right? They contain different kinds of information. It breaks up the story a little bit. Right. It's, it's in direct mm -hmm. contrast to this one, which is very linear. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say one is right and one is the other. I mean, you know, if we're talking about storytelling, it's, it's something, but, but there are documentaries that will be and there's other ones that are non-linear. So this one, I would argue, is much more non-linear mm -hmm. in that you've got the black and white, but you can also see it instead of black and white as, as different points of the story, and they're just subdividing them without having these heavy lines. Another. So again, differentiation of zones, we can cycle through <coughs> Yeah. Publishing. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, so uh, the first thing is you have two forms today that you can really publish with. Um, one is digital and one is uh, physical. And within each, you have a couple of different options. We actually, when we were setting this up, we, we realized that we have a difference of opinion on this. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll talk about the digital first. We have a very different idea on when digital should be used. In my case, I think mm -hmm. a digital presentation should be done when you're not there. I hate, hate to look at screens when I'm face to face with someone. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, it's, it stops being interactive and my, I'm either focused here or I'm focused there, but I can't really do both at the same time. And so I really don't like it when, when someone shows me their portfolio on a screen for the same reason that I don't really like and, and I've made a habit of not doing desk scripts anymore um, on someone's screen. It, you spend more time doing technical edits than you do actually discussing the work. Mm -hmm. It's like, let me zoom in, let me zoom out. If I want to zoom in with this thing, here's what I do. Hmm, done. Mm -hmm. um, and I can zoom in and zoom out really fast. If you do this on a screen, the other person is going to get nauseous. Right? So I just, and, and I can't go back and forth quickly. Inevitably, the technology doesn't quite work the way it does. The iPad crashes. Your computer runs out of battery. Um, you've got to move a big thing, water spills, and I just, it makes me uncomfortable to look on a screen. It doesn't feel professional, it doesn't feel refined, it doesn't feel like 
like you really want me there to look at your work. Karen, on the other hand. I am a little bit more forgiving on this, but I have to say I definitely appreciate when there is a hard copy. That, so in other words, um, you know, so the, the, the bound matter, the printed book as an object, as a thing, you know, that is not just kind of the content is carefully, you know, curated, but it's well crafted, right? So the binding, the cover, the size, um, the, the weight of the paper, so it's a, it's a nice object to hold in hand. I always appreciate that. Yeah. But I will also accept digital yeah. screens. <laughs> um, so if you are doing digital, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about the mediums. What are, there's two, there's two real ways you can do this. The first one is a website. And the second one is, is it issue or issue? I never know. I, I call it issue, but I Issue? Yeah. It is, right? It's just, it's right. Um, and for, for issue, it's essentially, it's a, it's a digital, do you guys all know what that is? Everyone? I think I have a page after this. Yeah. So it's, it essentially, it's a digital portfolio that you can, you can showcase. Um, and you actually, you know, simulates the flipping of the pages and so forth. So it's, I would say it's, it's if you're going to do a face-to-face, -face, I prefer that to to the website because at least in a face-to-face, -face, if, if, if we're in this kind of medium of a book, it's a little easier for me to see how you're thinking about things as opposed to clicking through 55 different links on a website and kind of jumping all over the place. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, when you're talking to someone, you want some narrative. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to keep that narrative in, in a website because you're like, oh, let me click here, let me click there. Um, it's also a great tool for you guys to be able to share and to create a community of like-minded people because you can see other people's mm -hmm. formats. And also, I think now um, you can link directly from your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. right, so it's a smooth, seamless transition. It, it, you know, it does has, have its limitations. Yeah. You know, the interface isn't, isn't always that smooth. You know, it does mm -hmm. like f you know, pause and freeze, which is why, so you notice one of the job advertisements, like they, they don't want this. Yeah. They wanted a PDF or, bound or a printed. A website these days is not a portfolio, I, I'd argue. It's, it, a portfolio, if it's talking about the narrative, since we've been talking about portfolios being this narrative, a portfolio is almost, or a website, is almost impossible to do that. And if it does do it, it's flash-based, and then it's just kind of a mess. There, there are ways to do it, but that's totally different departments. It's web new media, and it's an art, and it's very hard to do. Instead, the way I think of, of websites now is it's a teaser. Mm. It's your first kind of... Uh, glimpse into what someone does. So if you notice most firms that the websites that you like, they don't list everything on there. It's a very carefully curated show mm -hmm. and it's done in such a way that, that enough is left out that you need to talk to them about it. So you don't want to leave so far out that all you have is an image. I mean that's frustrating, right? You go to someone's website, to f like if you're doing a case study and you see two images and you're like, I, there's no text, there's no diagrams, there's nothing like that. But at the same time, the places that have all that information, first of all, are very heavy sites. And, and secondly, you don't really go through most of that stuff. You'll end up having a, a bounce rate of, do you guys know what bounce rate means? It's how quickly you leave a website. So you don't want to have, you don't want someone to just click and it wants to disappear, but at the same time, you don't want to spend six hours on it because it's uncomfortable. So I really like to think of it as, mm -hmm. as get your attention and find some place where you have your link for, your, for that and so they can contact you. I don't put all my stuff on there. I mean, if we go to my website right now, there's six projects total for my entire life. It's very, very, very careful. Uh, I know Ben is, is very much the same way, Ben Rice, mm -hmm. that, that it's only there so that a new client or someone who's looking at their stuff can get a glimpse of who they are as a person or who they are as a firm, and then they come to contact, contact them. Mm -hmm. And that way they sell themselves. They're not having the work sell themselves or mm -hmm. sell them. There's too many pronouns in there. Um, so those are kind of the two main digital forms that I think are acceptable in today's kind of day and age. Mm -hmm. um, the other advantage of an online thing is you might, all your stuff might not be necessarily um, static images. Mm. So if you are playing with augmented reality or if you do some motion graphics or you do some videos for classes, that's a good place. And then you can have either, a, you know, in the old days I used to put a DVD on the back of my portfolio and just put in a little, like design a little case and it'd go inside of the, the DVD and then there'd be a page in the book that would say here's a table of contents for the DVD. Mm. Um, today you can have a link, especially if it's like a PDF that you're giving someone, 
to click to, to click to the specific area where it, that video exists, whether it's Vimeo, YouTube, whatever. Um, the physical, I don't look anymore at um, books that don't that aren't bound. I, it's it's kind of it's an elitist thing. I, I just. I feel like if you can't spend the time to design one of these things, I, I don't know if I'm going to have any use for you or for a person. And this isn't for someone I'm hiring. This is for someone I'm working with. Mm. Like it just gives me a bad feeling in my gut that someone wants to collaborate, but they, but they, they don't even see this initial meeting as being that important, that they're going to curate their own work. What's going to happen later on when we have a project? That basically means that I'm going to have to do all that back-end stuff. Um, and at that point, I might as well not really work with them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel a little differently about mm -hmm. that, whether it's spiral yeah, it's, or... Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, the binding, so nowadays, so binding is, is huge, right? So um, there are different ways to, there are pros and cons to this, but the, the cons of, so binding, what we need is like where it's bound like a book, like an actual book. And where it's not bound is where you go to Kinko's, basically, and you have it, you know, like one of those I guess instant, you know, whether it's a spiral, spiral bound or like maybe sleeve portfolios and things like that. Um, they're just less professional and they're just less attractive as an object, right? They're in, in, um, to that point, you know, so if you're, if you're comparing, between, the work just uh, shows better in this format. So if you're comparing something that, where the person went through the trouble of laying it out and, and you know, publishing this, you know, as an actual bound material versus something where they didn't have time or didn't care enough, um, and just did the, the, the quicker version, right? This, even, even if it's the same work, this just shows better. Now, I do have an exception to this rule, which is if, they're, if you're showing a current project that you're working on, then I'm okay with any medium, really, um, short of the don't give me the Rhino file. Because like, some people, I've seen this happen. <laughs> like, they pull up the file, and it, again, it goes back to the thing, it crashes, it doesn't quite work, they have to turn on the shader settings. Oh, it doesn't really show it this way, but so forth. Um, so if, you, if it is a current project, I still want one of these. For the main thing, you need to have this. It absolutely super duper important. It sets you apart. It makes you look that much more professional. If it comes down to two people, one of them has this and the other one has Kinko's, this person will usually win unless they have some personal connection. Um, but if you have some projects that aren't within here, it has to be current. If it's an older project, my, my first thought is like, well, why isn't it in the book? Mm -hmm. But if it's something that's been done in the last couple of weeks, whether it's with it's Kinko's or even loose sheets, at that mm. point, I'm okay with. Mm -hmm. I want it to actually look kind of rough, mm -hmm. because I want it to feel like like it, you know you pulled out your sketchbook and you're showing me what you're working on right now. Should we do the business card letterhead? Oh. Yeah, so just very quickly, um, you know, so now is a good time. So you know, you're uh, starting to now assemble, uh, assemble. Um, there's a, there's a package now with your name on it, right? So there's a cover letter, a resume, now, you know, work sample sheets, uh, as well as a portfolio. And then, you know, in a lot of cases where these things are sent as an attachment, which is your email. Um, so, you know, so some of you have done this or are doing this in 450. We're thinking about title blocks. You know, how do you, you know, represent your partnership, your collaboration as, um, as a logo, as a, as a, as a title, right? What, so now is a really good time to kind of pick one, design one, and use it consistently, right, across for all of your communications, whether it's through emails or email signatures or whether it's, um, you know, letterhead, right, for your cover letter and your resume. In regards to that, something mm -hmm. super important. I've had this happen a number of times recently. Um, we're obsessed with titles. Everyone needs to have a title for everything. And I've started to see this trend of architecture students on people's business cards and on letterheads. <coughs> don't, don't, don't advertise that you're not qualified. Right? You're telling people, no, 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 don't take me seriously. I'm just a student. You don't have to put, legally, don't put that you're an architect. And I'm not even sure on the legality of saying architect student or student architect. There's all kinds of weird things with that. But you don't. Worst case scenario, put down designer. If you design anything for anyone, anyhow, you're a designer. You don't have to, just don't put architecture student. It's, it's not a big deal, but it, it sends some signal that you don't respect yourself as a designer or as, as a budding. Th you're not there, you're in training. And you don't want to give that message to anyone, especially if they're going to pay you. It doesn't, there's, I don't, and maybe you feel differently mm. about this. I've never seen a, a cost benefit to, to telling someone that you're not actually qualified. I think I would simply say that your resume is going to tell them who you are. That your 
you're a student, and you're describing yourself in a, a way that says, right now, I'm a, I'm a designer, I'm ready to go to work. I think it's, it's more something that, as opposed to disrespect, it's just something we don't do. Yeah. You know, we, we, um, if, if anybody knows a little bit about you, they know what you're doing, or, or it will create a, a question. You know, where are you in your life? What are you doing? That is part of what's on your resume, not on your business card. Yeah. And it should become, that's that's the question that will unfold rather than it being on your business card as some sort of status. Because it's really not, your business card isn't your status, it's, it's the business that you want to be operating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus then if it changes, you got to do new set of cards and it's a whole mess. Um, so we've got, anyway. yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. <laughs> Unless you work for a big company, and then it's not really your choice. <laughs> All right, so we've got a couple different ways of looking at portfolios. We've got, obviously, we've got issue. Um, then we can see, and we've got a bunch of people, and Christina is on there. Um, so good times, and we don't, this one's not, it's just a image, right? Yes, yeah, it's a yeah. picture. And you guys all know it, so that's not a whole lot of fun. So, so when you open it up, this is what our interface looks like. Right, and it reads like a book. Everybody knows this game. Okay. Uh, this is digital or physical? What do you guys think? It's not a, not a trick question. What do you guys think? Was it a printed book that's an image of, or is it a, is it a digital portfolio? Printed. Printed, yeah. It's, this is, this is my, my mentor when it came to graphic design and, and publishing, Bill. Um, this is part of his thesis. It's a two-page spread, so right there's the middle. Mm -hmm. sure, yeah, it's the middle of the page right here. Notice there's a relationship between the physical object, the sketches, and the process. So what, what is the ultimate goal of this, this thing? What do you guys think? Where's the money shot? Top left? Right, that's the effect that he's going for. And then everything underneath, on the bottom left, right underneath it, it's the concept. Here's what I was trying to do, skylight. He's got a little bit of text that describes it, a little thing of, of then talking about the process. And so this is really how to get this effect, this whole, la this whole spread. And he's got all these small images that really, this is the vehicle that we're using, this is the effect that we're trying to do. Here's how I thought about it, here's how I did it. And notice they're smaller. We immediately know that this is really about this one image, mm -hmm. but we've got all these different other layers of information, whether they're image or text, that describes the process. Mm -hmm. And also the smaller thumbnails are, you know, uh, perfectly proportioned to so the it's obvious that there's a module in if at play so two of these is one of these right and the spacing is consistent it just l makes for a really really clean well organized look but it's not perfect and this is done on purpose you can you can kind of imagine that this person's got a little bit of obsessive compulsive in them um, notice that these lines do not line up perfectly with with the, that's okay. did you, did any did it bother anyone when you saw it oh it did yeah. okay <laughs> um, you know, in his case, it, it seems like he was more interested in this, in this kind of overall gap and saying that, like, this is the idea, therefore it doesn't quite line up in the same way that everything else does. Uh, this is part of the same person's portfolio, um, but this is part of his portfolio, not his thesis book. And those of you who've taken the new version of 390, actually nobody in here has. So, all right, so you guys have never seen this. Um, well, actually, look. In the 390? Oh, okay, all right, great. Oh, you are the new version. Um, so again, we've got the money shot, we've got the big thing, and notice it's a detail. It's, there's this obsession with showing like the overall object. That's not really what this is interested in. This is really showing um, these weird things here. What, what are those called? Captions. Captions that are not telling the whole story, but they're telling us what, what in the world we're looking at. We've got different size images. What's more important in this thing? The final product or the process? I would say they're just as important. The craft mm -hmm. of making is as important as the craft of the product. Mm -hmm. They're getting equal amount of weight, especially over here where this is a smaller version of these, which is a smaller version of that. So it's like just playing of scales. But there's enough there that we can start to see the relationship between this opening and what's happening. The detail is really focusing. And it's not a detail to be sexy as a detail. It's easy to really show about how the connections actually work. And I like how it's a mixture of you know studio photography, like the big image uh, to the left, and then the smaller one to the right with the black background, which are you know very masterful photographs in and of themselves. 
mixed with, you know, juxtaposed against um, just a casual snapshot ph photography that described, captured the process, right? Yeah. So both kinds have a place. Now, the caveat approach. with this is Bill was a professional photographer for 10 years and an award-winning photographer and an advertiser before he went to grad school. So he's experienced. This is not, this is definitely not a normal kind of like, oh, second year portfolio. Uh, this is one from um, CyArk. Uh, so this is, again, a project. Do you guys see a grid here? You don't at first, right? So it's a six column grid. We can tell because this image isn't quite in the middle. And so usually you'll have kind of a, a gridding that's happening. But this is the, the money shot spills over into the other page. It's totally fine to do, and it's fu especially it's kind of a sexy thing to do when, you're, when you do bound books because it looks intentional. The catch is you want to go far enough over so that it doesn't feel like an accident. So it's, it's that game again of, of where you crop. You don't want to crop right. I don't want to crop the, this edge of, the, of my hand, and I don't want to crop right outside because it makes you wonder what's, what's being left out. So you want to have enough in there. And notice that it's kind of the overall form and then also this weird little thing over here about side plan with a north arrow. <laughs> um, but then when you turn the page, and I think that's the right, so slightly different project. No, it's the same project, but this person uh, definitely likes to show a lot of the different work. We start to see the de details and how the drawings, even though they're all slightly different, we've got the, the annotated rendering over here, line drawing, even more of a line drawing, and then kind of the thing. It doesn't look like they're the same, but each one has enough of the other ones to connect them. So there's always kind of like two of them in here. This has got the isoperms and the, the text, the annotations. This one is just the line drawings, but it's got annotations. This one has just the line, but then it's got enough in here that we see it's an abstraction, a diagram of the upper one. And then this is, again, it's looking at just kind of the overall effect of this patterning that's happening. So within that, which is the most important image? Which one? The one on the left? Who says left? Who says right? Who doesn't care? Everybody didn't raise their hand, yeah. I would say it's probably the one on the left just because it's also got the text and it's like a single image. It makes, it makes mm -hmm. our eyes go to it. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while, again, pacing. Look at how different ones. This one, text, image, and diagram, site plan. This one, overloaded with information. And then every once in a while, it's like, you know, this is 10 pages late. Yeah, it's, it's like, oh, right, the big, the big shot um, that comes over. And this, the white isn't part of the image. It's a full blade. All right, slightly different take. This is an A5 format. This is by uh, someone I went to graduate school with. And in this case, it's very, very regimented with the way it's laid out. But again, we've got the object itself, we've got the object in context, and we've got the kind of a still from the image. And then he does these interesting moments where he, his background is also in graphic design and advertising, so he likes to break the grid. Um, you know, whether you like it or not, he tends to overload his pages, that's his aesthetic. And he actually tries to do this on purpose. His, his, his motto of the first page of his book is actually throw it on the wall, see what sticks. So his whole aesthetic is to overload you with information. And the, the message he's sending is, I just make, baby. Like, mm -hmm. he just, he produces an obscene amount. And that's actually the, the message he's trying to tell is that, don't worry about curating. If I need to look, I can make the pretty image. But more importantly, I, I will give you 5,000 different versions in the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. You know, right or wrong, it, it works for him and for the type of work that he does. Um, this is one of his other projects. And notice that there's interspersed between, between mm -hmm. this super zoomed in image that is basically nonsensical. It's, it's purely an affect. Can anyone tell what's going on on the right? No, I helped in this project and I still have no idea what, <laughs> what it is. Um, but then on the left, he's, he's talking about how this component in this system works. And in this case, this is one of the few times where this, this type of green cutting board stuff works mm. because he again he's trying to show you that mm. he's he's making it's it's real it's physical it's not a diagram of this thing um, it's constantly working okay so I put these together just so you guys can see some ideas on the portfolio itself 
So on the left is the untouched, the actual thing. And this is a game I like to do all the time where I find something that I like, I'll scan it in, I'll, I'll scale it so it's the original size, and then I'll try to reconstruct or deconstruct what is happening in here. So one of the biggest misconceptions people have when they, when they make these books is that we assume that 12 size uh, typeface is uh, the normal size. And if you take, luckily, and I've started to see this even in instructors and, and, and um, all of us, we're going smaller and smaller with our print. It used to be 12 point Times New Roman double space was the standard. You see Times New Roman now, and it is like, like billboard size. It is huge. And especially if you go sans serif, you go Arial, it's even bigger. Um, so notice that the title, the biggest thing on a text, this is part of Bill's, the, the one we looked at his portfolio, is 11 size. It's, 11, it's an 11 point font. Um, how many different fonts is he using? One. That's a One, good thing. You two, want that. Three, four, five. Four. So what's oh, the difference between the font and the typeface? Mm -hmm. Helvetica is what? Uh, typeface. typeface. Helvetica eight bold is a hmm. font. So it's important that that um, in this case, it's a single font or single typeface, but he's using it in, in slightly different ways, so they get very different feelings. So notice it's all caps over here. That's one. All caps but smaller and not bolded is the second one and a different size. So he's really highlighting the title and then the location underneath it. Then we've got this one over here. I didn't even touch this one, but we've got Avenue. Same one, but it's smaller. It's less important. And you could actually argue that this is two different ones, right? Because this is probably like a four or something like that, or caption six. And so he's creating a layering of information. Our eyes can naturally tell what's more important, what's less important. But he's using all of the same, he's using the same typeface family so that we understand that there's a direct relationship between all of them. They're talking to each other. You don't have to do this. But the point is, even within a single typeface, you can find a lot of variability. We had a little bit of an accident on this one. I didn't have the right typeface when I did this. So occasionally you find it, and you can, you can fix this. It's basically every one of these E's is a space, but for some reason it didn't, it didn't capture it correctly. This is what happens when you take a PDF and you bring it in. Mm. Um, but similar, again, all Helvetica new. Some of them bolded, some not. No, these are two people at two different universities. They've never met each other. They've never seen each other's work. Mm -hmm. But notice there's a very similar aesthetic, even though it's a very different effect. Right, this is very kind of clean and, and organized and minimalist and quiet. And this is like, brrr, it's all over in your face. But it has a lot of that same information. Right, Cyarch, different part of the country. But notice, similar thing, a single typeface. Um, this tends to be the aesthetic these days. The, the title is all caps. You have the information, under the subtitle, the body, the caption, the page numbers, all that. Right, and again, small. We're talking about size five, a five-point font. Wow, it's tiny. You need a pretty good printer to be able to do this. Commercial printers can do this, but don't try to do this on your inkjet. You'll just have a line across. It'll be a barcode. So, second to last, just very quickly. Um, so, file management, backup. Right, you've you've have you've have had you know many many people nagging you, uh, and for those of you who started the portfolio process can, I, I hope, can testify to how easier your life will be if you adopt good habits, consistent habits, for file naming, how to organize, how to sort, um, and backing up, right? Do we all know the story of, a th our, you know, in this program, a thesis student who, um, through theft, uh, premeditated theft, right? So there was really nothing that she could have done differently. Um, so she lost all her files. A week and a half before her thesis review. Yeah. Like not just the thesis year, but all of the previous. She lost multiple sources of files. So she had a, one source, she had a backup, she lost them both. Right? So it happens, and it's, it's devastating. Or a fire, or a power yeah, outage, yeah, or a spike. Right? Or something. There's so many different ways where your data gets corrupted. Mm -hmm. so. so backup, you, you know, so, so do more than one backup. Don't keep them in the same place. Uh, do cloud backup. They're, a lot of them are very inexpensive nowadays. Um, unlimited, right? You don't have to worry about file size. Um, so backup, 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 backup. 
And then file management. So I know, you know, in the in the heat of the moment, deadlines looming, you know, you can't keep track. Like, you know, you just, you know, end up with, you just, you know, uh, keep adding numbers to uh, some weird file name. But fortunately, our program has something called the archive brochure, right? And so it's a great, you know, so um, if you are serious about it enough, develop a good habit and then, you know, institute it in the next semester, right? So, you know, have some logic and rhyme for um, naming the files, for when they were created, for what it was, or um, wh how it should be sorted, what it should be grouped with, right? Um, but even, even if for your earlier ones, while it's, you know, more or less fresher in your mind, go back and actually do the sorting, right? Do some housekeeping. Right, so that um, and this will so so what? How can this be a benefit? So let's say you're applying to five different places, and they you know ask they have slightly differing values, but you want to apply to them all, right? And so now you have to kind of tailor your resume, your portfolio, right? You have to kind of highlight, emphasize different things. So how can the file naming um, help you, right? right? Just so in the interest of time, right? So you can very quickly assemble and reassemble. Um, so in other words, you know, if you know that you're working with, um, you know, 20 raw files to describe a project, but you know that, you know, these five files are the ones where, you know, they, I worked with wood, woodworking tools, and this is what, sh you know, exhibits my love of, you know, making, right? Then you can very quickly, even in the way that you copy files over, um, you speed up that process, because you, you don't have to open up each one to decide, okay, what, am I using this or not using this? Um, scan and photograph models, they deteriorate, they get crumbled, they get coffee stains, they get broken and transport, right? So, so as best as you can. And do we all know that there is photography equipment that is available for student use as well as a camera? Um, so I can't stress enough for portfolio quality. It doesn't matter how many megs, you know, these, um, your cell phone phones, you know, expand into. It just never competes with um, a, um, a professional grade f uh, camera, which we have in the department. It, it really um, does, right? So don't only rely on, right? So if you're taking, you know, um, you know progress shots that's going to be shown in a theory series and they're only this big, um, these are fine. But for the money shots, you want the studio quality photographs. And then, so again, you know, looking at it retrospectively, you know, set aside some time, you know, over the break or otherwise when your class loads are late, evenings, weekends, whatever, um, you know, once a month. But, you know, fine tune the projects, right? So they're always, you know, so think, you know, this is really great if you kept great notes or sketches or diagrams at the final review. Um, so try to, you know, sift through those and kind of repackage your project in a better way. You know, now that you're a more mature student with more experience, you know, your project, though you can use the raw material that you created in your third and fourth year, but, you know, present it in a, in a, in a slightly different framework. One.